Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo. There's been a lot of hype in ancient times and in modern times about uh, the return of the Messiah, the second coming, when the end of days is going to happen, when the uh, end times is going to be fulfilled. But um, I'm here to tell you some news uh, because I'm sick and tired of hearing all these ridiculous false dates that have been predicted that we hear over and over again that he's going to return and then he doesn't return all these all these year all these years we've been hearing this and what do you think that look what do you think that looks like to the outsiders when they see how completely ridiculous we are how false and completely contrary to the truth what we teach is what various groups who claim to be christians teach about when he's going to return it just gives the name of Christ, the name of Messiah, which is Yahushua, a bad name. So, this video is to basically encourage you all to stop being ridiculous and do some research before you make a ridiculous and wild claim. Now, the, I mean, Isaac Newton, he studied the prophecies. And Isaac Newton said he he said he did not know when he the Messiah was going to return, but he could prove in his belief he could prove from the scriptures, mathematically speaking, that it was impossible for the Messiah to return before the year two thousand and sixty A.D. Now you know you might just uh, ignore what Isaac Newton has to say. You might just say he wasn't very wise or whatever, but maybe he's onto something. Maybe if you look at his research, maybe you will also conclude similarly, similarly that just as scripture says, certain events must happen first before the end times can come, before, before the tribulation period can come, there are certain events that must precede it prophetically. And before those events happen, the end, the tribulation, cannot come. So, it's just, we, we, need to, we need to look into it more and do research before we claim things that are of a very um, out there nature, very extraordinary nature. Um, and also, I do not have just a problem with people who throughout these completely false times that, that they predict when he's going to return, but for also the people who say we do not know when he's going to return. Those people are in direct contrary to scripture as well. Scripture tells us to look for the signs of his coming, and so that, and to tell, and it tells us to not be in the dark about his coming. What did the Messiah say at that time? He said, you do not know the day or hour, and neither do the angels. In other words, in that day of time, they did not know the plan of God. But who says that the plan of God could not be known in later times? Think about it for a moment. When we're in the seven-year period of tribulation, surely we're, we would be able to count. We have, you know, we have ten fingers, and... If there's only seven years to tribulation, surely we can count these seven years. If we realize that there's a seven-year peace treaty that has begun, or whatever you want to call it, maybe not a peace treaty, but a seven-year period of time where something significant happens, we can do simple math and conclude he's going to return at the end of the seven years. So, uh, yeah, there are prophetic indications that people will be able to know when he's going to return. So basically I just proved to you that, that those words of the Messiah applied only at that time he spoke it, not to all generations. So you realize he was talking to his disciples who still didn't understand everything that was going on. He had to still explain so many things. For example, on the road to Emmaus, he explained to two of the uh, disciples um, everything from the scriptures that talked about the Messiah. 
He had to do that still, even after he had already died. They still didn't understand. So, in the same way, the people back then and the angels did not understand when the end was going to be. Now, some manuscripts say the sun didn't understand, but I do not believe that is correct. I do not believe the sun did not know when. I believe the sun did know when. But it's still possible maybe he didn't know because he was also a human. So at that time, the sun did not know when it, he just didn't have the insight into prophecy to know when he was supposed to be coming back. But later, a little while later, we have been able to receive the insight. Like within that century, they were able to under receive the insight of when he was going to return. And the answer is, um, in all, all the early church fathers agree, the rabbis also hold to this belief, in the ancient rabbis anyway. Uh, you can find it in some of the ancient records of the rabbis. And you can find it in pretty much all the early church fathers. And in scripture, you find it in Second Peter, uh, Epistle of Barnabas. And it's all... Also, just very clear from the implications of the scripture itself that um, what's going to happen is that in the same way that the, the week of creation was six days and then the seventh day is the Sabbath, each day is as a thousand years with God. So, there will be first 6,000 years of fighting against the influence of Satan after the fall of man, fall of Adam actually. And then, there's going to be a one last period of 1,000 years, the seventh period of 1,000 years, which will be a Sabbath from Satan. Now, what do you find in the Revelation of John? You find in the Revelation of John, it says, 1,000 years, uh, Satan will be bound for 1,000 years. This is significant because it explicitly links it to Satan being bound for a thousand years. That is a Sabbath rest from Satan. In the first six thousand years, we have to fight against the influence of Satan in this world. So you can see that it's just so clear that it must be the case. Especially when all indications of studying indicate that we are so close to the period of six thousand years. All the indications of scripture indicate we are approaching the very end. We are so close. We are very close ever. Um, all the other people in the past who thought it was close, it has never appeared closer in like political and religious ideology than it has today. It is so close. But we need to be honest with ourselves and do a little bit of research. Because what does this 6,000 year theory reveal to us? And you know, Epistle of Barnabas also explicitly teaches it as true. And since Epistle of Barnabas was the apostle, one of the early apostles, he was um, co-apostle with, with Paul. Paul and Barnabas were companions. So Barnabas himself tells us that... Um, that that this theory of 7,000 year thing is true. So that means, if that's true, all you have to do is use the Bible to figure out when the year of creation was. So, so take the year of creation, or in my belief, take the fall of Adam, which is, according to the Book of Jubilees, only seven years after the fall of I mean, the fall of Adam was only seven years after the creation. So, take the fall of Adam, add 6,000 years, and that's when the Messiah is going to return. Many people have tried this before, and they came up with dates that have already passed. Why is this? It's because little do people know that there's something called manuscripts of the Bible and the manuscripts of the Bible have many differences between them. Sometimes not as significant, but sometimes more significant. And uh, the differences of the Bible 
in regards to when the year of creation happened, the differences of the manuscripts of the Bible, that is, differ widely. In the um, in the uh, Masoretic text, which, which is the standard text that most English translations are based off of today, um, it says the flood happened 1,656 years after the creation. So that's what most people use as the basis for the 6,000 year theory. That's completely absurd, because the Masoretic text is extremely corrupt and not inspired of God in any way. It is um, it is messed around by Jewish scribes uh, who change things sometimes deliberately. Um, it's a very inferior text to in comparison to the rest of the manuscripts. So then we look at the Septuagint. Most Greek manuscripts, that is, most Greek manuscripts say that the flood happened about 2,200 years after creation. So basically what ended up happening was the Septuagint altered things as well. The Greek scribes of the Septuagint changed things and they um, basically because of the Septuagint, the, the scribes of the Septuagint, the, the earliest ch church fathers and the Jews all taught that um, the when the like the time period that the Messiah came in uh, was 5,500 years after the uh, creation. And when I say Jews taught that, what I mean is the the historian, the Jewish historians like Josephus, wrote in that time because he was alive in that in that day. So in that day, he said they were about 500, 5,500 years from creation. He didn't refer to Messiah about that, but what I'm saying is when Messiah was was uh, doing his ministry, that was 5,500 years um, after creation, according to the Jew, the ancient Jewish scribes who based it, who based their dating on the Septuagint. Uh, and the early church fathers all were in agreement that it was, that it was uh, 5,500 years after creation. But um, there's another set of manuscripts that most ignore because they view it as inferior. But the only problem is the Dead Sea Scrolls prove that uh, these other manuscripts are the most reliable of all other manuscripts of the Law of Moses. And that would be the Samaritan Pentateuch or the Samaritan Torah. And there's a group, a religious group of individuals from ancient times known as the Samaritans. The Samaritans have their, the only scriptures they accept are the Law of Moses, the five books of the Law of Moses, the Torah, which is the Samaritan Pentateuch, Penta meaning five, and uh, Torah, obviously, you know, the Law. So, and in their manuscripts, which actually agrees with the Book of Jubilees, which is scripture, they prove that the flood happened in 1,307 1307 years after the creation not 1,656 not t over 2,200 years after it was only 1,300 years after okay so basically when you use the best manuscripts of the Bible, is what I'm saying, when you use the best manuscripts of the Bible, you realize that the 6,000th year after the fall of Adam will not come for about another 170 years. It's going to be more than 170 years until the 6,000th year has come. So basically, the Messiah is not going to return until almost the end of the 22nd century is going to be almost 170 years before the Messiah returns. So I just want wanted to, t to tell you all that so that you will be prepared and when you see that the Messiah hasn't been returning for hundreds of years, uh, over 100 years, you'll realize what the re why that is. So uh, thank you for watching and Shalom. Shalom, this is Annie Yahoo.
In this video, I would like to explain to you all why I am why I am legalistic and why I think that is a good thing. Now, first of all, I would like to clarify and say that the dictionary has several different meanings listed for legalistic, okay? And so the problem is the meanings get conflated, and that's not a good thing. Because then when people are meaning something different, they, they, they associate the two together, which should not be done, basically. Okay, but so, also, keep in mind, there is no word, as far as I'm aware, at least in the Hebrew, maybe in some English translations, but as far as I know, in the Bible, there is no word legalistic or legalism. Okay, so, now... Let's look at the definition listed in um, the dictionary. There are several, but I'm going to list. I'm going to name two. Strict legal adherence to the law or to a particular code, as of religion or morality. The second one is in the context of law, of relating to or exhibiting strict adherence to the law, especially to the letter of the law rather than its spirit. Of course, this is a Christian phrase that is drawn from the NIV, or not NIV, drawn from the New Testament. Um, but many people don't understand this phrase of what it means to, to the letter of the law rather than the spirit. People don't realize what that means. But, um... I'm going to ignore that second definition and deal with the first definition. The first definition is strict literal adherence to a law or to a particular code as of religion or morality. What do you call it with our government system when we strictly adhere to the laws? You know, if someone, uh, if there's a murderer out on the streets, uh, the, do you want the police to be legalistic, or do you want them to be not keeping the laws? Do you want them to not be strict and to just let people loose? What, same thing for rapists. Should we just let rapists run rampant? Or should we lay down the law and be strict and punish the rapists? I would think pretty much everyone would be in agreement that the rapists should be strictly dealt with in accordance with the law. Now, it's the same principle behind the law of God. God's law is superior to man's law. So why do people make man's law superior to God's law? Because uh, they make man's law as something that should not be done away with or, or abolished or fulfilled in whatever you understand fulfilling. Um, but... So... Man's law should be, should never be messed with. But God's law, we can pick and choose what we want to keep in the laws. And um, that's not, however, what the Messiah says. Now, what does he say? In John chapter 14, verse 15, it says, he says this. If you love me, keep my commandments. In another passage in John, I think it is, he says, if you are my friends, you will keep my commandments, or something like that. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but that's basically what he says. If you are my friends, you will obey me. But yet, you don't, you're not obeying him. You're not keeping his commandments. So how can you say you love him when you don't keep his commandments? How can you say you love him when you're not ob obeying him? How can you be his friend if you're not obeying him? Which he says is necessary to be his friend. Um... Sorry, I didn't realize my face was outside of the picture. But maybe that was for your benefit. Alright, so... Let's see here. So that was the first thing. Legalistic. Um, and also strict. What does strict mean? Strict means, according to the dictionary... Strict means precise, exact, complete absolute kept within narrowly specific limits okay conforming completely to established rule principle or condition all of that is a perfect description of what the messiah just said about for us he says 
if you love me, keep my commandments. Not keep some of the commandments, not keep my commandments sometimes. No, keep my commandments. If you love me, if you want to be my friend, obey me. Not sometimes obey me, but obey me. That's it. That's the only thing he says. In another place, he says, um, you, in order to be saved, I'm paraphrasing again, in order to be saved, you must pick up your cross and deny yourself of all things. If you don't do that, you won't be saved. Another place, it says, anyone who does not forgive his brother will not be saved. They will not be forgiven by the Father or me. Another one, if you do not um, clothe the naked and feed the hungry, then you will not be saved, according to Messiah. That's what he says. Anyone who does not do the least of these things, anyone who does not do these things, um, he says, paraphrasing, you will not be saved. So, it's in the Gospels. I, if, you, if you question that, if you doubt that, send me a message privately or comment on my YouTube channel and I will approve it as long as it's not you know, um, over-the-top harassment. So, um, so basically, the scriptures are very clear. We are to strictly obey. Strict as in we are to exactly obey what God commands us. Whatever God commands us, that is the law, and we are supposed to obey it. Okay, that is strict adherence, and the scriptures require strict adherence, okay? It requires obeying his law. That's what obedience is. Now, let's go back to what the spirit is, and what the spirit of the law is versus the letter of the law, okay? Here's what the letter of the law is. I've heard it so many times. The letter of the law is this. If the Bible doesn't say anything about it, then we can't say it's a sin. That's the letter of the law. The spirit of the law is, the reason the Bible says this is a sin is because of this spiritual reason that transcends the Bible. Because the Bible is not the guide for morality. I mean, it is a guide, but the Bible is not the foundation of morality. The Bible is the... the um, it points us to where morality is, what it is, but it's not the foundation of it. If the Bible didn't exist, morality would still exist. Adam sinned before the Bible was ever written. Um, many, many people have sinned and been saved and not been saved all before the Bible was written. So the Bible it has nothing to do with the establishing of morality. Morality exists without the Bible. But people make the Bible and morality equivalent, which is r ridiculous. It's not true. Uh, I've heard that that's, that's what Christians do with the whole entire Bible. But Jews primarily, especially in the Messianic movement, um, Messianic Jews, that is, in Nazarene Jews, they make it so that the, the law of Moses, the Torah, is the say all. So basically, I, I've heard this statement before from some people I know. I want to say lesbianism is a sin, but I can't because the law of Moses doesn't say this, it's a sin. Another one is, well, the law of Moses doesn't explicitly condemn prostitution for all individuals. Therefore, it, it, we cannot say it's a sin for all individuals. And it's not a sin because the law of Moses says it's not a, it doesn't say it's a sin. That's what they claim. Of course, prostitution is always a sin. Ridiculously, they reject that. But they reject it because they cling to this idea of the law. The written letters are superior to the spirit. The morality is in the spiritual principle of the commandments, not in the written text. The written text is to help give examples of the spiritual law, not to... And, all-inclusive uh, rule book okay that's what the whole thing distinction is between spirit and the letter okay so many disgusting and abominable commandments and doctrines are derived out of this idea of sola scriptura 
So anyway, that's the end of my video. Thank you and shalom. Shalom, this is Ian Yahoo. I'd like to discuss in this video the issue of the uh, the adulterous woman and um, the Messiah, in which is mentioned in John chapter eight. Uh, many Christians like to use this to uh, to prove that the Messiah taught against the law of Moses, that he that he made it so that now grace is given instead of condemnation. But uh, I want to challenge this concept here. Um, I think most people are aware of what John chapter 8 says, but uh, if you're not, just read it through again, and then the following will make sense to you. That's what I'm about to say. Um, I wrote this up, and I don't really know exactly the, a better way to put it, so I'm just going to read it. I, I'm going to read it myself. Um, so I was having a discussion with somebody um, on Facebook, right? And um, I was trying to talk to them and tell them that original sin is not uh, is not taught by Scripture. It's not acceptable according to Scripture. Um, so I'm going to read first of all. This is what uh, um, this is one of my one of someone on Facebook that I know who uh, who taught me that. Um, who was trying to tell me that uh, that original sin is true and that the Messiah came and abolished, uh, changed things of the law of Moses. So he says this. I'm trying to tell him that you can. there are some people who have never sinned in their lives. So he says this to me. He says, you show me a person who is without sin and I will yield my position about original sin. And then he says this, When Jesus said, Let him who was without sin cast the first stone, was it not because he knew that all men were sinners? When Jesus said that the person who even thinks about committing adultery is a sinner, wasn't it to show that all are sinners? When he said, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. Was he not saying that the nature of man is sinful? Okay, that's what he claims. This was someone on Facebook. Okay. So, um, so now let's see what, uh, what I said in response. So, in response to his claim that the Messiah said he is without sin and cast the first stone was to show that we are all sinners and therefore should not condemn one another, I'm going to quote this. This is what I said in response to him. Okay, ready for this? Imagine this. A bunch of super law zealous individuals approach Christ. I am going to insert myself into the story because I am one of those super zealous law Pharisees in my, in, in my religion of today. So, alright, so here's, here's my insertion into the story. Here's how it would have turned out if I was alive in that day. If I was one of the Pharisees in John chapter 8, here's how it would have gone down. He, he that is without sin cast the first stone. The Messiah said that. My response. Where does it say in the law of Moses or in any of the prophets that a sinner cannot stone someone who deserves death? The law commands the people to execute the adulterer. How then do you expect me to reject the law and follow you when I don't accept anything else you say? Why would I just drop everything I'm doing, my stones, etc., when you tell me only if I have no sin I am supposed to cast the first stone? You are making up rules, the very thing you accuse me and my brothers of doing. Unless you have a legitimate argument, I am going to ignore you because you obviously know nothing of what you speak. For you think a Jew like me would break the law of Moses simply because you told me to? That is absurd. Explain yourself, Messiah. The Messiah says in response, You are a fool for misunderstanding me, for you know that in 
when I said, he that is without sin cast the first stone, this does not necessarily mean what you think it means. Behold, I shall tell you what it means. You have inserted into the text the following. He that is without sin in all matters cast the first stone. But I say to you that the true meaning of this saying of mine is he that is without sin in this matter cast the first stone. For the law tells us that he is a that he that is a false witness should be punished with the exact measure they seek to punish the one they are falsely witnessing against. Now, this applies even if the woman is guilty, for even if she is guilty, the law requires two credible witnesses. Hear that credible witnesses. And a false witness is not a credible witness. Therefore, I tell you, he who is out without sin in their witness against her cast the first stone. If, however, you sin, uh, if, if, however, you are with sin, leave now or else I will testify against you and have you stoned just as you intended to do to my child. With that, me and the rest of my Jewish brethren quickly dropped our stones and left because we didn't want to get killed and we knew that we were false witnesses even though she was guilty. We did not have sufficient evidence to convict her and were wi merely willing to kill her without a fair trial. And this is God's righteousness, that which makes sense, not that which is ignorant of the Jewish teachings. So there you have it. That right there just proves and demolishes this concept that this passage uh, in John chapter 8 uh, teaches that now it's grace and no longer the law. And another thing too, Christians teach that Messiah fulfilled the law in every way. And how did he do that? By perfectly obeying the law. But how can you perfectly obey the law when you disobey the law? Because the law of Moses commands us to stone adulterers in a fair trial. So if Messiah was co contradicting, disobeying the law of Moses in this issue, he did not fulfill the law of Moses. And therefore, the law of Moses would still apply if that were true. So... Really, there's no way to, to, to fit into this passage that the Messiah um, changed things. Because he had, how could he change things if he had to fulfill it? You know, he, he couldn't fulfill it by teaching against it. It's completely absurd. So you see that uh, also, again, as I said, it makes no sense that a bunch of super pharisaical individuals would stop their would put down their stones and refuse to stone the woman because a random heretical individual because they thought he was heretical that is a random false prophet told them not to do it why would they care what a false prophet says if it's not in the law of Moses or if it's not in their father's teachings so don't you see that this is completely absurd your concept that the adulterous uh, woman story shows us that we are now lo no longer under the law, but under grace. It's absurd. It's completely ignorant of Jewish thinking and Jewish uh, doctrine. It's contrary to the entire Pharisaical religion. No Pharisee in his right mind would have dropped their stones because a random person who claims to be God says to drop our stones. Okay, you have to understand that. And you clearly don't. But it's so obvious when you look at it from a pure, unbiased perspective that this story is in full agreement with the Law of Moses and not in contradiction to it. Anyway, I could keep going and rambling, but I think that I've made my point. So I thank you for watching this video. And uh, I hope you stay tuned for any other videos of mine. So uh, thank you again, and Shalom. Shalom, this is Oniyahu. I am making this video because I want to address something that uh, isn't really being discussed by most people. 
and that is uh, the issue of Numbers. Not the book, not the book of Numbers, um, but the issue of how many people are part of your religion. Um, I'm going to basically tell you that, I'm going to reveal to you that Christianity as we know it, historical Christianity, cannot be the true faith according to the Bible. And why do I say this? It's because the scriptures are very clear that only a few will be saved, and especially so when he comes or when he comes back. But we don't find this with the the way it is today. So allow me to explain a little bit. Okay. So. Well, you know, actually, first I'm going to uh, read the verses themselves, okay? So, um, I'm going to read the passages. Now, I'm, I'm going to stick only to the 66 for, for you all. But there are some extra passages in other scriptures that do discuss even more so the whole few will be saved idea. But the 66 is sufficient to make my point to the Christians, so I will do that. Um, okay, let's see here. Okay, so first of all, the very first thing is um, we see in Matthew chapter 7, it says, Enter by the narrow gate. This is verse, seven, uh, verse 13 of um, chapter 7 of Matthew. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Um, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. What do you think few means? Many compared to few. Many implies that, well, many could be many uh, different things, but when it compares many to few, it's obvious that, first of all, that means the majority of people will not be saved, according to this passage. Um, so the majority of people will not be saved. In addition, not only the majority will not be saved, but only a few will be saved. Do you know what few indicates? That indicates a very small amount compared to the rest. Not just a less amount, but a very small amount. It says few there. Perhaps, unless the Greek or Hebrew is different, it could be, but according to the English translation, few is not just less, but that's something pretty significant. So that was Matthew chapter 7. So in other words, if your faith has the has it so that the majority of people on, on this planet are in that religion or are saved? That's not true faith, according to the Bible. Um, and not only it has to be less, but it also has to be, as I said, few. So let's now go look at other scriptures because you might say, well, what is few? How do you define few? So, to clarify the ambiguity of what few is, I'm going to read these other passages of Scripture. Okay. Um, so. so, we have Matthew chapter 24 here. The Messiah is predicting the end times. Okay. And he says that, uh, let's see here, where is it? Um, okay, so it talks about the, uh, I'm going to start reading from verse uh, 36 in uh, chapter 24. Because of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not 
know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, so right there it says, the, son, the coming of the Son of Man will be like as it was in the days of Noah. It's not going to be exactly the same, but it's going to be so similar that there's going to be so many there's going to be so many similarities that we will see, and I venture to say that um, that the very few being saved is one of those things. There's also something one of Paul's writings. Um, see if I can find it in the search bar here. Um, it's in Thess Thessalonians, I believe. Um, sorry, one moment. Uh, okay, so Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one to three. No, uh, it might maybe you have more verses than that. Okay. Chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or, or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, uh, unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits uh, as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Um, so I right hear Paul talks about how, you know, there will be, uh, a great deception in the end, in the last days. And wow, we are in the last days. And how long have we been in the last days? We've been in it since basically the Messiah left. That's we've been in the last days since that time. Um. And now, remember I said the uh, days of Noah. So shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Well, uh, I'm going to read now from Luke. No, I'm sorry. First of all, um, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, it says, When once a divine long-suffering uh, waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Okay, so a few... And then it connects it to eight souls. How many souls were alive of humans um, before the flood? At, at the time of the flood, that is. Um, well, you can do it like very, very conservative estimates. Or you can be fairer about it and do it more broadly. But... To be the most conservative you can possibly be, basically, um, you're looking at a 1 to 1,000 ratio here. Eight people went into the ark. There were at least a thousand times the number of people on the earth as, uh, as Noah and his family. That's a very conservative, extremely conservative estimate. But even with the, with that little itty bitty tiny, the smallest we can make it. In other words, the best we can make it for, the opposing people. Uh, the people that oppose my point in this video. There's, it's still only a, a ratio of one to a thousand. So think about this for a moment. How would that compare today? Well, a one to a thousand ratio would be basically only seven million people today being of the true religion. Okay, seven million. There are seven billion people in this world. 
what religion is there that has seven million individuals or more? I mean, excuse me, seven million individuals or less? None. There's nothing close. Every type of Christian group is has more, many, 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 many more than seven million. Only a few small Christian groups have less than seven million. And they don't differ in significant enough ways so as to be separated or distinct from the rest of Christianity. There are about two billion Christians, 2.2 .2 billion Christians, that is, uh, that, that identify as Christians, that is, on this planet. 2.2 .2 billion. Do you realize how crazy that is? That's almost... I mean, that's almost, uh, well, that's definitely a third about, it's like a third of the entire population. Okay, that's not few. That's almost equal to the rest of the world. And um, it also, as I said, it ignores the whole thing with the days of Noah. Uh, our, at the end times, the last days of when he returns will be like the days of Noah. I'm going to read another passage. This one's even, this is probably the best one for this. Luke chapter 18, uh, the Messiah says this. He says, Then the Lord said, starting in verse 6, Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge, judge said, And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? This is a rhetorical question, but it's implying, the Messiah is implying, that when he returns, there will be so little and few faith, saving faith, on this earth, that it will be an extremely difficult task to be able to find someone saved. It would actually take work to find someone to be saved. You wouldn't be able to easily find them. They would be hidden and you would have to investigate extremely to figure it out. That's how bad it's supposed to be when he returns. By all Christian counts, we are right near the very end. He's coming back soon. In their belief, he's coming back super soon. If this is true, then will there really be faith? According to the Messiah here, no, there's not really going to be much faith at all. But if Messiah were to come back today, there's a lot of faith today. There is a lot of it. It's, it's, it's uh, pervasive throughout an entire society. It's the very bedrock of our of our country and, and the rest of the world. Christianity is through and in basically every sector of the world. So it's just absurd to me to suggest that Christianity uh, is a true religion and yet to believe that these claims are in fact true, what the Bible says. If the Bible is correct, then Christianity can't be true by this count alone. Because the majority, not the majority, but so many people are going to be saved according to Christianity. But this is not so. That is not what the scriptures teach. So, um, it's just, it's unbelievable. There are also other proofs, though, that Christianity is a false religion. Just their their teachings are evil, illogical, and contrary to Scripture. Those are the th three best reasons that I can think of to reject Christianity. I can go into in future videos uh, what those things are, so I can fairly present it. So that it's not not just me saying they're wrong, but to actually show the evidence, but this alone discredits Christianity. 
as we know it. Um, so anyways, um, there's a lot more, but this is all for now. Uh, so thank you for watching, and shalom.